we think of AI as futuristic, something out there just beyond now. But its roots, they go back further than you think. Before smartphones, before electricity, before machines could think, we had to learn how to think. This is the origin story of artificial intelligence. And it begins not in Silicon Valley, but in the silence of a medieval library. Long before silicon chips or code, a man sat beneath a golden dome in Baghdad, pen in hand. He wasn't building a machine. He was writing the instructions for one, centuries ahead of time. His book introduced a methodical way to solve problems, step by logical step. It became the foundation of algebra. It gave us the word algorithm, and it changed how the world would think forever. In an age before printing presses, his ideas traveled, hand copied from Baghdad to Cairo, to Cordoba, to Paris. His logic crossed languages, empires, and eras. And one day, it reached a machine. Before we taught computers to think, we had to teach ourselves how to think methodically. That journey began not with code, but with ink on parchment and a revolutionary mind. But thinking logically wasn't enough. The real question was, could a machine ever think on its own? Alan Turing wasn't a computer scientist because computers didn't exist yet. He was a mathematician, a code breaker. And in 1950, he asked the question no one dared. Can machines think? Turing didn't believe intelligence needed a soul or a body, just logic, just a machine that could mimic understanding well enough to fool a human. That idea became a test. Sit across from a machine. If you can't tell it's not human, has it passed? We now call it the Turing test a philosophical gate between calculation and thought. And it's never stopped haunting us, because Turing didn't just invent a test. He reframed intelligence. He asked if emotion could be predicted, if conversation could be simulated, if consciousness might one day be faked. Alan Turing died before any of it came true, before neural nets, before ChatGPT. But his ghost lives on in every system that speaks like us. And the question he asked still echoes, if a machine acts human, does it matter if it isn't? Not long after, machines stopped just calculating. They started learning. In 1956, a group of scientists gathered at Dartmouth College with a radical idea. What if machines could learn? They didn't have much, just blackboards, punch cards, and hope. But their belief sparked something bigger than any of them could have imagined. Just a year later, a computer taught itself to play checkers and beat its own programmer. It didn't know strategy. It didn't understand the game, but it adapted. It learned. That moment marked a turning point. For the first time, a machine wasn't just following instructions. It was improving on its own. The hardware was clunky. The code was primitive. But the principle was revolutionary. This wasn't automation. It was the seed of intelligence. And while the world didn't quite grasp it yet, a new kind of mind had just awakened one that wouldn't stop evolving. In the 1980s, AI wasn't popular. It had overpromised. It had underdelivered. Funding vanished. Headlines went silent. But deep in forgotten labs, a few researchers kept going. They had a new idea. What if we modeled machines after the human brain? They built artificial neural networks, systems of virtual neurons that learn by adjusting connections. They were slow, unstable, often wrong, but they worked. These early networks could recognize patterns, simple ones like shapes or letters, not because someone told them how, but because they learned from examples. Most people ignored it, too speculative, too strange. But those scattered, glowing dots of digital thought, they were the beginning of everything. Today, neural networks power your phone, translate languages, drive cars. But it all started with a few minds and a machine that thought like one. But learning wasn't enough. AI needed a challenge. It found one on a chessboard. In 1997, something extraordinary happened. A computer beat the world chess champion. IBM's Deep Blue defeated Garry Kasparov, arguably the greatest mind the game had ever seen. It wasn't creative. It didn't think ahead like a grandmaster, but it could calculate millions of moves per second. And that was enough. Kasparov was shocked. 
The world was stunned. A line had been crossed. For the first time, a machine had beaten a human at the game we believed defined intelligence. But Deep Blue wasn't learning. It wasn't adapting. It was brute force, raw computation at massive scale. Still, the moment mattered. It showed us what machines could do with speed and data. It wasn't artificial intelligence as we know it today, but it was a warning shot. If a machine could master chess, what else could it conquer? What came next wasn't hardware. It was data, everywhere. By the early 2000s, the internet had changed. It wasn't just a tool anymore, it was a data factory. Every post, every search, every swipe created digital exhaust, tiny traces of who we are, what we want, and how we think. For AI, this was gold. The more data we gave it, the better it got. Algorithms no longer worked from theory. They trained on us. Machine learning models improved, not because someone rewrote the code, but because the code could learn from more. Social media, e-commerce, smartphones, each added fuel to the fire. And the real turning point? It didn't happen in a lab. It happened in the cloud. Now, every click feeds the machine. Every choice refines the model. And somewhere, silently, an algorithm is learning from you. There was no announcement, no fanfare. AI didn't arrive with a bang. It arrived in your inbox. It started finishing your sentences, suggesting your music, rerouting your commute. While we waited for talking robots, AI quietly embedded itself into daily life. It wasn't science fiction anymore. It was sorting email, approving payments, matching faces, delivering groceries. The revolution didn't scream, it whispered. We didn't notice it spreading until it was everywhere. Now it listens, learns, decides, not in labs, in kitchens, phones, pocket-sized minds running billions of tasks every second. AI didn't just arrive, it became normal. But then came a model that changed everything. Not because it thought better, but because it spoke, like us. When OpenAI released GPT, even the experts were stunned. It wasn't just answering questions, it was writing, telling stories, finishing your thoughts with eerie accuracy. GPT wasn't smart, but it was trained on everything. Books, tweets, code, conversations. It didn't understand meaning, but it knew how words worked. And that was enough to sound human. By GPT-4, the difference between man and machine began to blur. People asked, is it passing the Turing test? But the real question was, who's writing this? GPT didn't end the conversation. It became part of it. But with power comes consequence. And AI isn't just writing stories. It's writing rules. As AI spread, so did its power. It started making decisions. Who gets a loan? Who sees a job posting? Who gets flagged for review? But algorithms don't come from nowhere. We build them. And sometimes, we build them wrong. A resume gets rejected because of a name. A face gets misidentified because of its skin tone. A video disappears from the internet. No appeal, no explanation. AI doesn't choose its values. It mirrors ours. And that mirror can be cracked. From biased hiring tools to facial recognition surveillance, from content moderation to deep fakes, the ethical stakes aren't theoretical anymore. They're in our laws, our feeds, our lives. So the question isn't whether AI works, it's who it works for and who it leaves behind. Will machines ever truly think? Not just follow instructions, but reason, plan, understand? That's the promise and the fear of artificial general intelligence. A system that doesn't just perform tasks, but learns anything we can. Some say it's decades away. Others say it's already beginning. What happens when machines can teach themselves to code, to negotiate, to design new AIs? Do we build a partner or a competitor? The truth is, no one knows. But one thing's certain, we're standing at the edge of something massive. The next intelligence on Earth may not be born. It may be built. So the question isn't just what will it do? It's what kind of future do we want to share with it? So what's next? That's the question. Machines that learn, models that write, systems that don't just follow code, they evolve. But we're not just watching it happen. We're documenting it. Every origin, every leap, 
every ethical mess we're still trying to clean up. If you're curious where the story goes next, stick with us. The future of AI is still being written, and we're following every chapter.